Hey everyone, welcome back to the Reclamation Podcast, where our goal is to help you reclaim good practices for faith and life. Today is episode 58 of the podcast, and I get to sit down with author, food blogger, and Instagram influencer Taylor Kaiser. Taylor shares in her new book, Eat That Cookie, about what it means to replace your identity uh, with food for your identity in Christ. Such a, a deep, practical conversation. Some of the things that we talk about in this conversation is how we give food too much power in our lives, right? Whether it's good food or bad food, if that makes us a good person or bad person. And I'm just going to tell you that as a guy who's often wrestled with coping mechanisms, this really resonated. Even if you don't have a problem with food, what you're going to hear is some deep spiritual truth about what it means to root your identity in Christ. So it is my deepest hope that you enjoy our conversation today. If you do enjoy the conversation, uh, please subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts, leave a comment wherever you can, and give us a review on whatever platform you might be on. It helps people find us. Of course, the best thing that you can do is share the episode with a friend if you found it helpful, share on social media, get the word out about what God is doing in this community. And, and don't forget... If you're not yet part of the community, we'd love to have you. Text the word RECLAIM to 66866. Text the word RECLAIM to 66866. Sign up for helpful tips, blogs on what it means to reclaim the balance of faith and life. So without any further ado, here's my conversation with Taylor Kaiser. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the podcast. I'm here with author, uh, blogger, Instagrammer extraordinaire, Taylor Kaiser. Taylor, how are you? Oh my gosh, you're making me blush, first of all, but I'm <laughs> doing great. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited. Well, hey, listen, it's truly my honor. And uh, I got my hands on your brand new book, Eat the Cookie, and uh, I was blown away by the practical nature of it and how it, how it intertwines with faith and identity. And it's, it's really interesting to me because, um, because it, you're very vulnerable and open right out of the gates in the book about your story and, and I guess maybe you could tell us a little bit about your uh, complicated relationship with food and, and kind of what that looks like. Yeah. Do you want the whole backstory like from? Whatever you want to tell. You could just whatever, whatever you feel is, uh, it, is what people need to hear. Yeah. Cool. So I guess I'll kind of just do the whole thing because I think you need to know like the very backstory to get the current story. Um, so it really started when I was going, cause I'm from, I'm from Canada. So we don't do like the middle school thing. We go straight into high school. So I was going into high school and I was like, I think 12 or 13. And like at that age, like, you know, girls want boys to notice them. Boys want girls to notice sure. them, all those things. Right. So I wanted to look pretty and like be popular. So, and I was like, I wasn't like a fat kid, but I was a little bit chubby. Like we all are when we're 12 and 13. And so I grew up in a fairly healthy family, but not like ever by any means so mm -hmm. my dad exercised he's like hey well why don't you just exercise with me and I was like okay like this is a new thing for me cool and exercise even back then you know this was 20 years ago this it's like a different thing that from now um so I started running and naturally I lost weight because when you move more it's typically what happens and people started to praise me and of course that felt really good of and of course you know like that just kind of fed my ego and just I'm very much a perfectionist which I didn't even realize back then but I know now and that just fed the beast I like to say and then very quickly I uh, started doing more exercise and eating less because I thought you know a plus mm -hmm. equals c less food more exercise equals weight loss and it got it went from a healthy good for me thing to a very, very dark thing because health and fitness is important, but we can totally take it too far. And it was definitely not God honoring and it was very much worldly. And that ended me up in the hospital almost dying um, when I was 12, 13. So that is where it started. And then like, you know, I praise the Lord. That's actually when I found my faith back then. And he walked me through total healing through high school. But then I was like in my late teens and I was dating someone who I thought was going to be like the one, you know, you think at 18, you're like, Oh yeah, this is the one totally, you know, uh, side um, note. I, I did marry the one at 18. Oh, well, I'm jealous. <laughs> she was my high school sweetheart, but the growth since then, uh, we, we joke all the time 
that if we would have known the hard parts in the middle, we don't know if we both would have said yes at, at 18. <laughs> so I love that. That's an awesome story. That's yeah. great. But that was not my story. So we broke up and For then sure. I guess, you know, my old, my old self went back to, I felt so out of control with that because mm. like, I felt like my whole life was crumbling, which is of course super dramatic for like being 18. But that's just- yeah. But don't, don't you think though that, uh, we're naturally dramatic. Humans yeah. are naturally dramatic. I, I feel yeah. like I feel like that has to be part of the story that we have to have drama in there. And so it's totally. it's important. I feel like without drama, we don't really even have stories. Cause like that's where our like issues come from from being over oh, right. over dramatized. I don't even know if that's a word, but we're gonna call it a word about our own lives. So, anyways, we broke up. I felt out of control. The only thing I knew how to control was food because yeah. it was my past. Um, so I went back to doing that and then throughout my, you know, 19 to say 27, I just really struggled. I was never anorexic, but I had a very bad relationship with food. You know, God wasn't even part, really part of my life. I would say he was, but if you looked at my life, like God was like, you know, low and food was really high on my, the way that I was living. And when you actually say, do you follow Christ? You have to look at like what your life is actually looking like, you know? Sure. I thought about it all the time. I exercised all the time. I couldn't eat something that was off my plan or I couldn't miss workout days. And it was really stressful. Like I, I got married eventually. It was stressful in my marriage. It was stressful in my okay, So you actually tell a story that in the book that I just found uh, very eye-opening because I, I, my, my relationship with food is also complicated just as a, as a coping mechanism. But one of the yeah. things that, that you talk about is purse chicken. Oh, my purse chicken. I, and I was, I was wondering if you could share that story with my listeners because yes. it's, it's such a good story. But I think, it, I think it does a really good job of illustrating yeah. the tension in what you were feeling. Cause it, and now aren't, at this time, you're also a food blogger too, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. So yeah, kind of fill us in on some of those details because you, you've built a really nice, very admirable business in the food blogging kind of world while at the same time living in the tension of, of all of it. Totally. So the purse chicken was like a little bit before the blog, but like it definitely, like, is a really, like you said, a great story. So I was so obsessed with like eating the perfect amount of food that like I, whenever I went out for, you know, with my friends for dinner, I wouldn't able to, I wasn't able to order food and actually brought like little Ziploc baggies of like cooked chicken like super boring in my purse and then I would like go to the bathroom and be like gotta go to the bathroom and I'd eat the chicken out of my bag like in the bathroom stall because this was like the only safe food like how sad is this as like a 20 21 22 year old that I can't go for dinner I have to go eat purse chicken in the bathroom stall so that was that's a very good picture like you said of like my relationship with food and then I started my blog after I got married so I was 22 I think um, because I was obsessed with food because I was so hungry that I always wanted to think about food. And then I started this blog and at first it was very much like a dogmatic way to be like, my way of health is the only way you should be. And here's the recipes that you should eat. And then as I healed, which I'm sure we'll talk about later, it kind of changed to actually wanting to direct people to Jesus and live. Cause I still believe healthy eating and exercise is important. And Jesus would want us to do those things but in a way that honors him. And so that's how I've now shifted and it feels so much better. What do you think the biggest catalyst? Um, I, I know in the book, you, you talk about a, a powerful morning after a date night with some pancakes. Yep. And um, I, I guess, what could you tell us a little bit about that story? And then how, how did, um, what was that kind of catalytic moment for you? So it was, I've been married a couple of years. I was like, I think 26, 27. And like I said, I just been in this disordered space for almost a decade. And me and my husband were having a date night, which we have once a week. Um, and he was like, let's make pasta at home. And I was like, oh, carbs. <laughs> like that was terrifying for me. Cause I, you know, at the time I thought carbs were evil, which now I'm a carb lover, but that's a different story. Um, so we were making pasta and like we're at the grocery store and he was like putting the ingredients in the car and it was like, butter and like cheese and flour and like inside I was like ugh <laughs> just like cringing eye twitching inside just like what is happening and then naturally went home and like he can't cook I'm a food blogger so like I was gonna make the pasta right he was gonna like watch and bring some wine so I made it and then I actually like made it fail like I made it like wrong so that we wouldn't have to eat it because I like uh. didn't want to eat the carbs and the butter and I was like this is so scary it's gonna make me gain weight overnight 
And then that's the night that I just like went to bed crying because I was like, this is my life. Like I am almost 30. I wasted all my twenties, like being scared of pasta. Like why am I scared of flour and water? Like it's food, like that's a ridiculous fear. And then that was the next day. I was like, something has to change. And that's like, when I went, I was like, I need to start eating. And then we went out for pancakes, pancakes. And it's been like a 360 overnight since then. Well, one of the things I appreciate about the way that you've kind of written this book is that it, it takes us through your journey and it also takes somebody who might be struggling um, with, uh, with their identity in food through the journey as well. Can, can you kind of help us see um, how, at least in, in North American culture, we've kind of created this weird this weird arrangement with food. I, I, I mean, and just as far as a coping mechanism and what's the right way to eat and the wrong way to eat and mm-hmm. what does all that look like? Cause you, I think you do a pretty good job of kind of covering a lot of that in the writing. Yeah. So I think a lot of people in this culture have a very disordered relationship with food and we don't even know it because we're just surrounded by like different diets all the time that we think it's normal. So um, a lot of people, you know, see food as good versus bad. Like, brownies are a bad food, broccoli is a good food. But when we're doing that, like we're giving food way too much power because God created all food and he says that all food is good. And he says that, I can't remember the scripture, but he says that no food is unclean. But us us crazy humans have kind of like ignored him and we have these emotions of like food has morality. And then when we eat a bad food, that means that we're a bad person. And like I said, that it's just giving food so much power in our lives and we're overthinking it so much because God created food just like for nourishment. And when we're obsessing over it, one, it's becoming an idol. And that can look like my story where I under ate and over exercised because I wanted to have a perfect body. But it can also be in the opposite way, like a lot of emotional eating, going to food to fill a void that only Jesus can fill. You know, when you're feeling stressed or anxious, you're eating. And we just have put food, whether it's like in that and, you know, one side of the spectrum on this crazy high pedestal. And it's really should just be something that we eat for nourishment and maybe sometimes not for nourishment because we're allowed to eat brownies and feel okay with ourselves right. and then move on, but not obsess about it and actually have it like dictate how we feel about ourselves or how we like run our day. I love that. Um, how, how would you recommend, and I know that you do some online communities where you walk mm-hmm. women through this. And, and one of the really cool things is I've kind of dove into your life is this, how intentional you are about community. And so I know that you're helping hundreds of women all the time. How, how would you, or how do you tell those women and men to, to deal with keeping food in the right place? Like, let's get super practical about it. If someone is struggling with mm-hmm. emotional eating, how do they uh, park that off to the side and pick up uh, kind of the right placement for that food? Yes, I think it really just goes to like figuring out like why, like why are you mm. going to the emotion? Like what, like what is the emotion that you're feeling? Is that stress? Is it anxiety? Are you just bored? Like a lot of us, we just turn to food and like we don't, we don't allow ourselves to feel our feelings because in this culture, like we are addicted to rush and we're starving for stillness. I actually read that in a book, so I can't like take that quote. But um, and it's, that's a good it's one. So, I know it's like I, I like I gotta tell you, but it's so good because we are just addicted to just rushing around. And when we're rushing, we actually don't allow ourselves to process, to feel those feelings, feel those emotions, and we don't allow ourselves to be still. Which one is when we actually find God, and two is when we can process those emotions instead of going to food. So I think just really allowing yourself to feel, I mean, this sounds super like woo woo, but like journaling is actually super helpful when you're feeling any kind of anxiety, stress, even boredom. And just ask yourself like, what is it that I think that food is going to give to me? Because normally when we're emotional eating, we think food is going to make us feel better, but like nine and a half times out of 10, it makes us feel worse because we feel like we've made this bad choice because we're, you know, we're just a failure because we're eating this food and we can't process our emotions. So it's really important to be like your own therapist and dig under like, what is the emotion that you're feeling? How, how often do you journal? Are you an everyday journal or twice a day, multiple times a day? What's that look like practically in your life, maybe back then and, and even so now? I definitely don't journal as much now just because I don't really think about food anymore. Like it's not really something that like, it's like it's part of my life, but it's not like an obsession. But back in like the day when I was really working through this, definitely like every single day. And even more if I was like really feeling some kind of emotion and I had to figure out like why I was feeling that and what I thought that eating or not eating was going to bring me. 
One of the things that you write about in the book is how um, some of the driving factors in addiction uh, and control, addiction to control is fear and trust. Can you talk a little bit about that relationship of fear and trust and not just how it plays out in food, but how you see it play out? And I mean, because now you're working with lots of people uh, around these things and it feels like fear and trust are these two huge mountains. Yep. Yeah, totally. So like you said, this is not even just food related. I think everybody deals with not wanting to give up control because of fear and trust, whether that be career or parenting or like anything. And it really just comes down to when we are fearful and we're not trusting God or, I mean, of course, this, I wouldn't say God because this is a faith podcast, but you're not, you're not feeling like you're trusting something. That is when you try to control. But normally when we try to control something so hard, it's actually when we feel so out of control of it because it's just like, like we're just kind of like grasping at straws, if that makes sense, because mm-hmm. like ultimately we're not in control. We like you and I know that it's about God being in control, but it begins this vicious cycle of being so afraid, not trusting that we try to go on to, con- we try to latch on to control and then we feel out of control. And so we feel out of control. So we try to control something else and then we feel out of control. So we try to control something else. And it's just like this never ending vicious cycle. And really the, the key to breaking that is to, to trust and just to know that like, if God will bring you to it, like God will bring you through it. Do you have any rhythms or practices that you do to help build up that trust muscle? Because it, it feels like it feels like it's something that we do that we need to work on and, yeah. and we need to get better at. And, you know, like obviously in different seasons of our life, we'll trust differently. How do you build up the, the trust muscle? Yeah, so an exercise that I do with myself and also with the woman that I work with is just like, it's super simple. Like it's a little journaling exercise, but look back on your life and like, where has God shown up for you? And it could be like a super simple thing. Like he did this little thing for me, but to realize that like he has shown up in your life for you and he has taken care of you in certain times. And then that can really help if you even like keep that. So you can read back if you're going through a period where maybe you feel like God's a little bit far off and maybe you're not trusting him, but just kind of realizing that God like is not a one trick pony. Like if he's shown up for you in the past, it's going to show up for you in the future. So you just have to like be aware of those moments because when we're feeling so unsure and so like wanting to grasp onto control, we don't remember those moments. Like we just, they just like fly out of our brain. So really writing them down and being able to reference back to them can be really helpful. It, it it feels like uh, a lot of that is the process of what you, what you've done in the book, right? Mm -hmm. It is if you kind of like, uh, in some ways it almost feels as vulnerable as like, wow, I'm kind of reading her journal. It feels like, and, um, what, what has writing this book and this kind of, you know, obviously this takes a long time and writing a book is a horrible, ex- wonderful experience. Oh, true. What, what has it taught you about God? I feel like it's like, I feel like my faith has like never been stronger because of this book, just because like, for one, like I really had to dive into the Bible to find scriptural references, to find like anything that was like a rela- related to topics that I want to talk about. So like one, that just strengthened my faith, but it just taught me that like, like I just said, like God isn't a one trick pony. Like look at the Israelites in the back, like in the back and like a million years ago, he showed up for them. They were like wandering around for 40 freaking billion years. I know that's an exaggeration, but, and then he saved them and like they, they made it to the promised land and he is still showing up for us now. And I just think people sometimes think like the world is crazy and like it is, but he will continue to show up because he knows what's happening with everything going on in the world, like no matter what happens. And I just think it's helped me trust more that he truly is the Alpha and the Omega, the, the, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, all those things. Oh, I, I love that. And, and I love, uh, I love the process of, of getting there and, and what that looks like. Um, one of the things you talk about in the book is uh, a quote from your dad, uh, which is feel fear and do it anyway. Yeah, totally. And, Uh, it's that's a great quote but you also include some uh strategies on how to do that can you kind of take us through some of those kind of the the process of what to do when you you feel the fear and you're going to do it anyway Mm -hmm. yeah so there's a couple strategies i mean one you have to just do it because the only way that we determine if our fears are actually like real is to do it and see that like we didn't die Mm -hmm. you know (laughs) So like, it, it sounds so scary. No, but, like, but I, I love that we do it and we didn't die. But did didn't you die. die, right? Did, no, right? Didn't did you die? No. Die. So like, it's really not that scary. Once you, do, and once you do things, your scary thing, whether it be eating a food, like getting the job, like whatever your thing is, once you do it like once, it's not scary anymore. 
Mm -hmm. So you just have to, to do it, just do it. And then there's a couple other like more like other like more in-depth strategies. Like I talk about like a stop sign trick. So when you're feeling kind of afraid of something, this is, sounds also like really woo-woo, but like it's a, it works. You kind of sit there, close your eyes and imagine a stop sign because this can kind of um, prevent those like scary thoughts from, from coming in because you can't actively think about scary thoughts while you're imagining a stop sign in your brain. Our brains are not that not wired that, that you know to, to be able to do that so just kind of thinking about that can be really helpful as well um one of the the beautiful parts uh, uh in the book that is you you actually use the word girlfriend in the book as if you're writing this book for a girlfriend yeah. um and and guys i'm telling you don't let that stop you from buying the book or reading the book it's it's still really good even though you you mentioned girlfriend about a million times yeah right um Tell, tell me, where did that come from and, and kind of explain your heart in there because it feels super intentional. Totally. So it is intentional. I mean, it is one, just how I talk. Like I wanted to write the book in a very, like, this is how I talk because I want it to feel like we are just having a conversation with a girlfriend or a friend or whatever, because I think that there's so much power in just creating like an actual authentic connection, whether that be on social media or through words or through video or through any just you know, means of communication and just actually feeling like you wouldn't like be friends with this person. So I think it was really just one, because it's my voice and two, because I really wanted the person to connect because I also think that when you connect with something, you really absorb it more. And I want, you know, the women and the men to read this book to really get something out of it and for this to actually set them free from the, you know, the issues of identity and worth and value and insecurity. And I think it's just a lot easier to do that when you have made that kind of friendship Plus it just makes the book more fun to read. And like, you know, books are just not like, books are great, but sometimes it's like, oh, reading a book is like, ugh. but when it's a little bit just like more upbeat and fun, it's just like, okay, I actually want to keep reading this. It, it does breed familiarity is what I found. It, even, yeah. you know, in, in the process of checking it all out, like it really does make it feel like you're sitting here. And uh, true confession, when I read the book after following you on Instagram for a while, uh, I definitely hear your Canadian accent in the words, which is really? absolutely, it's absolutely amazing. I love it. I love, I wouldn't trade it for the world. It's good. That's amazing. That makes it, me so happy. It's good. It's really good. Uh, you, you've done an amazing job at building community in this process. Uh, how, how, how have you done that? And why is that so important for somebody who might be wrestling with food and fitness and faith stuff? Yeah, I just think, I think I built it by being vulnerable and I know that like sounds like maybe cliche because everyone's like oh be vulnerable but like it's true I think that like my past or an old pastor once said that like our our hang-ups are our handles so like our hang-ups and issues that we have are our handles to of doors to open to create connection with other people so when you share those things like there's another person like I want to be like you know cheesy but the person saying me too like I have those issues too. And you're just able to create that community and realize that you're not alone because I think so many people, whether it be food or any other issues, think that they're alone, even though like we all know that other people struggle, like you don't actually like really feel it until you hear someone else say like, Hey, this is what I'm struggling with. And it almost is like a release for other people. Like I can breathe. This is not just me. You know what I mean? So I have to just be vulnerable and share what I'm going through for other people to almost be set free and we can all come along each other and kind of just help each other out if that makes sense. Oh, it makes a lot of sense. And I, I think um, I, I think that the idea of freedom is something that so many people long for and they, uh, they feel trapped by a lot of things. Yep. How would you define the, the taste of freedom that you got after – um, after your pancakes. Oh gosh. I mean, it tasted amazing. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> if we're doing the actual literal. But <laughs> well, that's um, a great pun and I didn't even catch it. Oh, I'm so mad oh, at myself. I'm Normally I, I point out the good puns, but. That was a good one. But like, actually, like it was just like, I feel like I want to say peace. Yeah. Like it was like this overwhelming sense of peace that I had never had in my life because I just wasn't thinking about what's the next thing, like what's the next thing I'm going to eat or not eat, or how am I going to work this off? Or like playing all these like mental gymnastics with myself, which so many people do. And whether that be food or anything, like we just always stuck in like these mental gymnastics. And like, that's not a fun place to be when your mind is just free and you're feeling at peace. And you know that like God is in it, God is here. He's caring for you. It's just like, 
you feel like I'm like a new person, like Superman, Superwoman, just like I can do anything because God has got me. And because I trust that whatever his plan is, it's like awesome. And I felt all these things after eating pancakes, which sounds crazy, but when you've been trapped in like the food gymnastics, it's, it's really awesome. One of the things that I've learned and I've got um, part of my story is I've got seven years sober from alcoholism and realizing that I had more of a coping issue than uh, uh, just a drinking issue um, is one of the things that I've realized in that process is that whenever you're using something to cope or obsessing over something, Mm -hmm. relationships always take a toll, right? It's, it's, it was, it was hard for my wife to be married to me during those years. It's, it's probably still hard now, but (laughs) That's a whole different, that's a whole different podcast. Uh, how, how has your process been to kind of heal and restore and bring that freedom to your marriage? Oh gosh, this is a good one. But this is like a crazy, it's, it's kind of like a big topic. Cause like a, at first, obviously like, like you, my it was very hard for my husband to be married to me. Like we couldn't go on date nights. He couldn't, he would plan dates for me and I'd be like after the gym. And then it's like, no, like I want to do it in the morning. Like it was, we fought a lot about it, all those kinds of things. And then when I started to heal, I thought it was immediately going to go from like bad to good. But there was this weird, like in between period where we almost fought more because for a few reasons, one, I didn't, I hadn't realized that I had put my own kind of notions of good versus bad food on my husband. And now he had almost bought into that belief too. So when he started to see me eat these like quote unquote bad foods again, it was almost like, why are you doing that? That's a bad food. Because he had kind of developed a little bit of a disordered eating pattern on himself just from living with me for, you know, seven years. So that was kind of like a weird thing. There's like a weird tension there. And then also like he he had never met me pre-food issues. So he didn't know pre-food issue Taylor. So it was almost like it was a good thing, but it was almost like he had to relearn to relearn me and like, who, who are you? Who did I marry? So there's this weird tension of like, I don't really know who you are anymore. Like it's a good thing, but it's a weird thing, if that makes sense. Sure. So there's this weird pocket in the middle of like just tension because we're like figuring out how to like live together with this new Taylor because I was com- a completely different person and then working through like the issues that I had put on him. Now it's, because that was a couple years ago, but now it's amazing. Like now we can go on date nights. We just, you know, we do whatever we want. There's no stress. There's no, I mean, obviously there's like marital stress, but like around food. Right. And, you, know, you guys just bought a house. There's yeah, tons we, of stress. Yeah, we just bought a house. We just made like a bazillion mile move. There's stress, but there's no food stress. Like, so that part is amazing. So it went from like bad to like better to amazing. Uh, was there anything specific that helped alleviate the tension? Because I imagine that there are some people listening right now who have tension in the marriage about all of the things that we're, we've been talking about, how, how did you guys, um, how did you guys walk towards each other in the tension yeah. uh, of, of, and the healing process? So definitely therapy. We yeah. have to go you know, for therapy. I mean, I'm definitely a big proponent of that because we don't know how to heal without the prof- like help of a professional. Lots of prayer um, and just honestly time. And I was like, time heals all wounds, super cliche, but just that time of like learning how to be married again, learning how to, to do life together really helped. So I think getting a little bit of professional help is good, but also just praying for each other and just spending time together. Just cause like, like I said, we were like newlyweds again. We had to like figure it out. Yeah. I see my counselor every month, whether I need to or not for the last seven years, it's super important to me and big, big uh, advocate for mental health. Um, When, when you, look at your life. You're very vulnerable and open and you affectionately call your husband, Mr. FFF. Although I will tell you teaser, you do mention his name in the book. I right? know. You, you know, it, but like, and it's out there, right? It's one of those fun secrets in your community that everybody knows. Um, yep. How, how much tension do you have living uh, as a public persona? And, and how, how does that play into your, your marriage and really, I mean, obviously you put a lot of work into this blog over the years mm-hmm. and years and the Instagram. And yep. as a matter of fact, the other night was, I, I was literally laughed out loud when your husband asked the question, did you Instagram before you came to help me <laughs> about, about hooking up a trailer? It was a classic. Look, that's the kind of marriage stuff that I'm like, yes, I love that. Yep. Uh, how do you guys live in that tension of just being a, um, a public persona, let's say? 
Yeah, it's definitely challenging. And one, like when I started my blog, I, did, I never thought I was going to be like, I hate the term, but I never thought I was going to be an influencer. Like I never, right. you know what I mean? Like that's not what I signed up for. I'm not saying I don't like it. Like I like it, but it is definitely, definitely comes with a set of responsibilities. Like I feel that sometimes, you know, people are scrutinizing my life more than I would imagine. So I have to make sure I'm really careful about what I post on stories. And I also feel like this weird tension of like, I have to post everything on Instagram and stories because that's what people want, but they also want to live a private life. So trying to find that like balance has been a really challenging thing for me and it's challenging for my marriage because like the story said, like he's like, did you Instagram at first? Like I'm always on it and you know, we'll be you know having date night. And I just like, it's like autopilot. I just like look and scroll through Instagram. He's like, what are you doing? And I'm like scrolling. He's like, it's date night. And like, I don't even know that I'm doing it. So it's definitely, that's like, something that God's putting on my heart that I need to work on. But it's like that weird balance that I have to for business, but I don't like always want to. Yeah. It, it's a, it's a struggle for me and I'm, I'm a pastor. Right. And so then I'm always thinking like, man, I'm trying to put out good content and, and live in that tension. And my wife's like, Hey, can you just be present? No. Yeah. You, just, you know, like it's the, it's, it's the real tension and it, it's, um, you know, you mentioned something about uh, comments, right. And, and, one of the things that's really clear in your story is that this is a story about finding your identity in Christ yep. over an extended period of time. Mm-hmm. In the world that you live in now, I have to imagine that people are constantly coming at you hot, right? Like just all the time, like with comments and thoughts and just opinions because that's what people do. Yep. Um, how, how do you stay rooted and your identity in Christ when it's got, there's got to be so much negativity and, and of course positivity, but we only, you know, one out of 10, right? Negativity. Yeah. Right. Yeah. How, how do you live in, in all of that? I think it's, that's a good one because it's hard. Like I am very much like, I want to be like quote unquote perfect, which is something I'm still working on. Obviously not right about it in the book. Like, do, do you know your Enneagram number PS? Are you a one? I'm a three. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I know I'm an achiever. Um, and my husband's an eight, so it's a really fun couple. I'm an um, eight, but you guys get a lot of stuff done. We do. We get a lot of stuff done, but we also butt heads, which is another podcast. But um, yeah, it's it's challenging just because there's, like you said, there's a lot of neg- neg- negativity. There's keyboard warriors all the time. I'm constantly just getting like crazy DMs and comments. But I think it's just one, making sure that I spend my. This sounds getting cliche, but spending my mornings with Jesus really sets me up for the day. And just okay, if I spent my time in the morning with God and I've centered myself, I spent a time with you know, read the Bible, praying, I'm able to just like, kind of process those people better just because I have my mindset correct. And also just to know that like hurting people hurt people. Mm. So when I'm getting a lot of negativity, it's like those people probably need a little Jesus. Um, there's probably something going on with them that they're taking out on me. So I need to not take that personally. Um, I think it's something that's always is really important to remember. Yeah. And, and it, I would imagine it, it's a practice, yeah. right? Like it's not, it's, it didn't come easy. No, it doesn't. It, uh, it, listen, if, if I get done preaching a sermon and someone's got one bad thing to say about the sermon and 10 people had great things to say about the sermon, I'm sitting there like focusing on the, the bad thing. And it's just yeah. a, it's a struggle. It's, it's yeah. a real struggle, but I, you know, I do appreciate the honesty in it all. Um, one of my favorite lines from your book is I thought it was under control, but it was controlling me. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, I'm a control freak, self professed, <laughs> right? Like, yeah. Um, I'm an eight on the Enneagram, like your <laughs> husband. And, yeah. and so I, I wonder how, how do we gain clarity on what has control over us? Because I, I read that statement multiple times thinking to myself, man, I, there's so many people that don't even know that they're under the control of something else. Yep. How, how do we gain that? Uh, how do we gain that sense of clarity? Yeah, I think it, it comes down to being super honest with yourself. And a lot of people are like almost like scared to be honest with themselves because they don't know if they're going to like what they'll find. And I think like we talked about earlier in the podcast, like it just comes to like looking at how are you actually living your life? Like if you say, tell your, like, say you're write down your three things that you value in life. Okay, cool. And then look at your life. Are you actually living your life? Like those things are your values. And if not, maybe the things that you're actually thinking about, what are you thinking about all the time? What are you obsessing about? What are things that keep you up at night? 
those are the things that you have to look at and see like one are these healthy things to be thinking about or are these things these these are things that maybe I'm spending too much time and too much brain space thinking about and worrying about and because I'm trying to control them so much that now they're controlling me because I can't even have a free moment where I'm not thinking about them. Yeah. <laughs> That's a, it's a lot to process, right? Cause you know, a getting honest with yourself is like one of the hardest things we have to do, but yet it's really clear that in our walk with Christ, that's part of the process, right? And, you know, we would call that sanctification and trying to become more and more like Christ in the process uh, of all of that. Um, one of the last sentences uh, of the book is eat the cookie, uh, taste the joy, savor your freedom. Uh, and I thought it was beautifully written. And, and I guess, you know, what does that mean to you today? Yeah. So I think like for me, I use cookie because my issue was food, you know? Hey, so, listen, I love cookies. I, it's, yeah. I mean, it's, I, I'm, I'm here for it. Good, good. I love cookies too. That's why it's the book. But I just think like to taste the freedom and to savor the joy and taste the freedom, like anything that you're struggling with when you actually like lose those chains and you break free from those things, controlling you and becoming idols and defining your identity it truly is this, like I talked about, like that peace and that joy, and you're able to just like revel in it and you actually walk into that freedom. And I think it's really important to, to be able to do that and to be able to experience that because you don't know what you're missing until you actually are able to do it. And so for me, that's really what that means now is I actually, I ate the cookie or the pancakes and I really experienced just, just from that like moment, like just a complete life changer, just the freedom that Christ has for me that I knew he had for me because I grew up in the church and I read the Bible and like, you know, like mentally I knew it was there, but now I actually feel it in my heart and it's Mm. actually like real to me as opposed to some like magical fairy dust that I hear about in the Bible, if that makes sense. I was hoping that you might be able to give just a a brief word to the person who's in the middle of their addiction right now. And and maybe it's food, but maybe it's, maybe it's pornography, Mm -hmm. maybe it's infidelity, maybe it's, I mean, I, I've been there and I feel like you have too, where that your entire world feels like it's caving in around you. Mm-hmm. Um, what word do you have for that person who might be listening right now? I think I just want them to know that that's not their identity. Like I yeah. think so many of us, we get those issues and we're like, well, this is just who we are. I can't change it. It's too hard. I'm not big enough. We serve a God who is big enough. And who can free you from that. And that's not the way that he created you. And so like, and it, it is worth digging through the muck and the mire and finding out who he created you to be. That's beautiful. A, a year from now, what are we celebrating about eat the cookie? Oh, am I supposed to like dream big or? I, it, it's Hey, it's your world. I'm just working in it. Oh gosh. I think we're celebrating just people set free. Yeah. Like, I don't want to say like book sales or anything. I just think people set free. That's the goal of the book. That's beautiful. Uh, So where can people find you if they want to pre-order a copy of the book, if they want to to get in one of your communities, where's the best place to get started uh, in that kind of journey with you? Yeah. So I think uh, my blog is foodfaithfitness.com. And then if you want to find me on Instagram, it's instagram.com slash foodfaithfit. And then I have info about the book, both on my blog and in my Instagram profile. That's wonderful. So the last question I always love to ask people, okay. it, it's an advice question. Okay. okay. And so what I want to challenge you to do is to go back and give yourself one piece of advice. And I'm, I'm going to take you back to a very specific day. I'm going to take you to your wedding day. Okay. You and Mr. FFF are just said your vows. You're walking out of wherever it was you guys got married at. And you have the opportunity to pull yourself aside and give you one piece of advice what would you say to yourself? I think it would be take time to stop and smell the roses, like in Mm -hmm. everything in life, because as a three and him as an eight, especially like we are very much like the quote unquote power couple. Like we want to do all the things and do all the things now. And we feel, we both felt like we kind of the first couple of years of marriage kind of rushed through it and didn't take time to just really enjoy life, enjoy each other, enjoy family. Like we're all right. Like that kind of thing. So I just think take time. Like I said earlier, we're starving for stillness be still, know that he's God and know that like life is going to go on if you don't get all the things done. Amen. That, that's a really good word, especially in the COVID world that we live in. 
Uh, that's, that's so good. Thank you so much for being so generous with your time today and for putting your heart and soul into this book. I'm praying for it and for your community that it just blesses tons of people. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. I loved it. Such a great conversation with Taylor. I think she's got a lot of wisdom around this topic of coping and identity. And I know it really caused me to think about how much connotation I put on my own life as it pertains to food, which, if I'm honest, is just an area that I continue to wrestle with. So, again, I, I really hope this was a practical and helpful conversation for you. If it was, please do me a favor, subscribe, leave a comment, leave a review, let us know on social media. We'd love to hear from you. And don't forget, we want you part of this community. So text the word reclaim to 66866. Sign up for helpful emails, blogs, all the things so that you can be connected to uh, an entire group of people who are just trying to do their very best to reclaim good practices for faith and life.